well. But is there another model? The question is, is there another model? Naturally, we struggle to find it. I'll tell you the answer to what's going to be in the fourth lecture. Nobody can find one. It's worse. A, we're not so dumb. As, you know, we're pretty advanced compared to the Mayans. We've analyzed it very carefully. We almost prove it's impossible to find one over a wide class of ordinary possibilities. If it's going to be any kind of a model, it's going to be at least as weird as this thing. The reason is that the answers from this are so simple. That is, it looks a little complicated, you're not used to it. But mathematically, those forms and those curves are mathematically so simple, and the rules are so simple, it's hard to make any mechanism at all that can reproduce such simplicity. The Mayan thing was really fairly complicated. The numbers were peculiar. There's no explanation of them. This analogy, our numbers are not peculiar. Those, they have an explanation for it. It's a different situation. One more thing about gravity, I would just remind you, we don't really have a good model because what comes to, why is it that there's a force inversely as the square of the distance? And what do you mean inversely as the square of the distance? That's mathematical. And Newton was the one who taught us that we can make progress if you stop arguing about that. He said, I make no hypotheses. I don't explain the gravity law. I tell you what the law is. That tells you how the things look, and you can predict where the stars are going to be, and that's the pattern. But I don't, at the moment, know. But he left open the question, just like you asked, maybe tomorrow somebody will figure it out. On your particular question, it's always possible that tomorrow somebody will figure it out, but it's going to be very difficult and very strange. Do you like the idea that our picture of the world has to be based on a calculation which involves probability? Uh, not really. If I get right down to it, I don't say I like it, I don't say I don't like it. I am very highly trained over the years to be a scientist. And it's a certain way I have to look at things. When I give a talk, I simplify it a little bit, uh, I cheat a little bit to make it sound like I don't like it. What I mean is it's peculiar. But uh, I never think this is what I like, this is what I don't like. I think this is what it is and this is what it isn't, okay? And whether I like it or I don't like it is really irrelevant. And believe it or not, I have extracted it out of my mind. I do not even ask myself whether I like it or I don't like it because it's a complete irrelevance. It's a kind of a dumb answer, but it's true. And when I'm lecturing, I shouldn't have said I don't like it. What I was trying to say is you probably don't like it. There's nothing I think we can do about it. It might have been something else. I, I don't know how else to express it. It's not really personally a dislike. Have you left out anything in this lecture which you need to add later? It, it's a very difficult, and I worked very hard on the lecture to try to use as my examples things that I didn't have to change later, the interpretation slightly. You know, I couldn't get an elementary enough process that I didn't have Later on, I have to make a little change. You see, we talk and we see as though it's reflected at the surface. Actually, what's really happening, and with a deeper understanding, which I should do later on in the lecture, but I might forget, is that it's reflected by cause. It affects electrons in here, which re-emit light here or here or here or here or here or here. And what really is the things that we have to add is not the arrow from here and the arrow from here, but a whole lot of little ones from all the distances from there to there, but believe it or not, you get the same answer, okay? So what I really ought to do, and I would do, if I were doing it correctly, would be to talk about the reflections from every interior part and adding arrows, but I would rather add just two arrows the first time than an infinity of them. So I cheat, didn't cheat a little bit, but I got myself in a slight hole which you picked up. The actual reflection is from the material, the, the electrons in the material. In the case of Newton's thing, it's because the electrons which are reflecting from the glass here and here are interrupted in their pattern. And when you add the arrows, it comes out to be, believe it or not, the same as if you just take the one, the one from here and one from there. Uh, perhaps just for those who can, I don't want to make it too hard, but just to give you a clue of the marvelous way it works. If you added tiny arrows to represent reflections from everywhere, instead of just talking about it reflected from here to here, which is a good equivalent way, but if you took a whole lot of little baby arrows, each one a very, very tiny angle from the other, all the same length, which is the reflections from all these places, you see you generate a circle. And what I was using instead of the circle were the two arrows, 
which were the beginning arrow and the end arrow of the circle. And what you told me is I shouldn't talk about the reflection on the front surface and the reflection on the back surface. I should talk about the reflection of all the stuff in between, and it's, but it's equivalent. The net result of going around here is the same as going up here and back on that one. It even accounts for the minus sign. At least. That is, the distance from here to here is what you get by putting onto this arrow this one backwards. Well, I got a, the, whole, the distance is the same. See? So I get I got it upside down. In my but uh, this line is the same line as you would get by going in a circle. So it's really reflected from the interior. But in the first lecture, I thought I'd just get two arrows instead of an infinite number. Does your picture apply to anything besides electrons and light? This aspect is universal over the whole of the world's phenomena, as far as we can tell, not just a light and electricity. This phenomenon of drawing arrows and making areas for probabilities. The probability amplitudes, we call them. The amplitude and the probabilities are the squares of these amplitudes or the circles of them. That's universal. The next problem is a rule for how to draw arrows under different circumstances. What kind of arrows do you draw under different circumstances? What are the rules? One of the rules I told you is it turns at a certain rate for light and so on. Uh, those are the rules that we do not know well in the case of the nuclear phenomena but we know ex virtually exactly, or at least as far as we can tell experimentally. I lost my numbers. Uh, for electrons and light, the rule for how to make the arrows is completely, apparently completely known, and nothing is ever complete. But within the accuracy and so on, it's known. What's not known is how to, the rules for making the arrows when it's protons that are moving around and so on, okay? When you are looking at something, do you see only light or do you see the object? Well, the, the, the question of whether or not when you see something, you see only the light or you see the thing you're looking at is one of those dopey philosophical things <laughs> that an ordinary person has no difficulty with. <laughs> Even the most profound philosopher in sitting eating his dinner has many difficulty in making out that what he looks at perhaps might be only the light from the steak but it still implies the existence of a steak, which he's able to lift by the fork to his mouth. The philosophers that were unable to make that analysis and that idea have, have fallen by the wayside through hunger. <laughs> Can you tell us whether in the future your theory will be found to be wrong, or is it complete? No, of course not. How can we know what the final thing is? I tell you only what we know today. Can I tell you more? Do you want me to tell you more? Would you like me to tell you what we know tomorrow? <laughs> I'm sorry. I have the Nobel Prize from the past, not from the future. I do not know the future. And I answer in a similar way to your likes and dislikes. If you ask me what I think will happen in the future, I'll tell you I do not think. I do my best to understand what I'm under supposed to understand, what we know so far. I do not know what you're going to discover next, okay? I can't. I know only it's... You're talking about the edge of the discovery business. And it's impossible to say what's beyond the edge. So I can't answer you, all right? Except to say that the history of physics has been that the things that looked like they were nicely set aside were, and it turned out to be erroneous upon further discovery. And since society has continues to be vigorous enough in its endeavors to investigate nature, it's almost sure, from a social point of view, not from a theory of physics, <laughs> that new things will be found out which will not fit in, and uh, we have no way to tell whether some young man, perhaps from New Zealand or somewhere, will find another way or more about this stuff, so it'll have a different picture in the future. Obviously, I can't say. I tell you what it looks like today. You call it my theory. It's not my theory. It's the theory everybody uses. 